Um, my name is Balaji. I'm one of the co-curators of uh, this track, which used to be hyper-casual. Now, we, what we are going to talk about is where do we go from there, right? Just to set the context, I'm the director of publishing and acquisitions for a company called Sunday. And this talk is about transitioning from the so-called hyper-casual to the, what we call as the next generation of uh, casual mobile games. Now, what does this mean? Let's go into it. So who are we? At Sunday, we develop and publish um, what we call as the next-gen casual mobile games for the mass market. Now, the question is, what is the difference between casual games? We'll look, uh, we'll look into this during the talk. So as a context, uh, we have five offices. We started in Hamburg in Germany. How many guys have heard of Hamburg? Great. <laughs> uh, to be honest, I heard about it much late in life. Um, then we started in Berlin, Munich, all three in Germany. But also we started last year in Bangalore. We have some people working here. And also uh, this year in Istanbul. Um, we are backed by a company called Bertelsmann Media. How many guys have heard about Bertelsmann? Do you, how many guys have heard about Penguin Random House? How many guys know Madonna? Come on, more. <laughs> I feel old now. So uh, Bertelsmann, as a media company, uh, owns the rights to many music labels, and, and it is the largest uh, media conglomerate in, the, uh, in Europe, right? So uh, why Sunday and what's the context is, uh, all the new age app business is done via our group called AppLike, of which we are part of, right? But um, what does this mean? That we are focusing mostly as a media company. Since we are backed by a media company, we focused, we started focusing on uh, the so-called ad monetized games, and this is why for us the focus is still ad monetized games. Um, and then for us, um, the, the focus doesn't change and the rules don't change. It's about how do we transition from here, right? Because we still believe the market is there. So what is next-gen casual mobile? All of this started with this great debate, I think, two years ago. Hyper-casual is dead, and then someone was like, hybrid casual, and hyper, uh, what is hybrid and what is hyper, right? Do, you, do any one of you have any opinion on what is hybrid casual? And uh, do you think hyper-casual is dead? I also don't think it's dead. I think it's evolved, right? What does this mean? So what is the problem statement of this business? The, the, basically, the, 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 the problem started because um, the hyper-casual market was all about finding the uh, cheapest uh, CPI, the cost per install, the cost to get one user, and then getting, getting an LT because the CPI was lower, the LTV was, uh, also could be lower, right? Um, but now, achieving that at a mass scale has become super difficult. Why? Various reasons, like gas prices, wars, stock market crashes, the factors that you don't have control over, right? And what does also mean that the classic hyper-casual monetization that you show ads at every levels doesn't work. Why? Because the value of those ads is lower, but also users are not used to uh, what so many ads just for the same experience. So uh, for us, at Sunday, we put a lot of research, a lot of work, and a lot of experiments into how to crack this issue. And basically, it was like, how do we rethink to achieve this LTV greater than CPI? Right, so what does this mean? So let's look at how we think about, um, about the next 10 strategy, but I do believe this largely applies to everyone in the market who is uh, looking to make mobile games for the mass market. What is mass market? Mass market means that you cannot target the audience. It's a very broad audience. It is not possible to target on iOS anymore. Android is also tricky. And then you're making games for everyone, right? So what does this mean? So how do we look at it? And I do believe that this is how most people should look at it. What games can be profitably scaled and what games work on the market, right? Now you can, in the, in the old hyper-casual age, you would do games, you would see what's in the trending charts, you would see TikTok trends, uh, you would make some uh, small games and that would work. But then um, it doesn't work anymore, right? And especially if you're small teams, or you, I don't think any one publisher can uh, make games for... Uh, all the genres that work in the market. So basically what we need to do is attain focus, right? This is where you will win. Uh, so just let's look, uh, take a look at like what is working now, and I do believe that this will work irrespective of a publisher or a developer. This is what is uh, going to work for the next few years. Um, so one category or one bucket of games. Uh, just, just before that, how do we look at this? We look at um, 
and we look at it like how do, can we achieve the users, right? How do you achieve users for any of these games? Any idea? What's the basic principle? How do you do it? Anyone? So basically, you create an ad that you show into another similar game, right? So you show it to the players who are already playing a game, and the difference is, OK, what is the experience, different experience you're creating for this user? So basically, uh, look at the games that are already working at scale, because that does mean there's a large, large bucket of users uh, uh, to whom you can show ads uh, and uh, scale the game at scale, right? Um, so what we see is what we call replayable puzzle experience. So basically, you solve a scenario by logical thinking, um, and you don't play against the AI, right? You take one decision on the, other. On the right. Uh, the example is Parking Jam 3D. I don't know how many guys play the game. Excellent example by Popcore, where you tap the screen and clear the uh, screen from uh, of the cars, right? Now you can think of different mechanic, a different theme, but the the rule and and the game becomes more complex over time. It's well layered, but the rules don't change, right? You can create a new object or you can create a new obstacle or an enemy, but you have the same rules. So this is how you achieve the depth in this game. And then also for uh, higher profitability, uh, games like this use the so-called meta, meta layer and the game economy, which was not uh, present in the old hyper-casual games. Um, again, we say puzzle experience. This is different from classic puzzles. It's about like solving a scenario through some action, right? So um, here the player has to experience that they solve something. Uh, then. On the right, uh, I believe it's, uh, it's a game that inspired a lot of uh, the so-called new hybrid casual action games. We call it like power progression. Basically, there's a core loop that you make more, get more powerful uh, by playing through, and you get difficult levels that you can only solve by upgrading, by watching a rewarded video. Uh, all of this, I believe, started from Archero, and then you have games, uh, many, many games inspired by that. And then you create additional demands through like additional game loops in the back. But in the end, when you think of the game, there's only one game loop. Then the classic puzzle and meta layer. If you look at this, a game called Tangle Master by Rolic. Uh, there's also Collect Them All by Voodoo. So there's a, they, they were like inspired by classic puzzle games for the so-called ad monetized audience, right? Uh, the, the puzzle loop is wrong. So for example, a classic example is when you test any of these games, they just release one level, and they were still able to see that the players played it for 800 or uh, more seconds. So what does that show? It's a very really highly addictive core loop. And then um, the visual progression is like um, you, add, you make it more complex visually, but the rules, again, don't change. Right, And um, the most important part between these kind of games and classic puzzle games is when you put ads, the, the engagement doesn't go down. This is how you check that, OK, I am making a game for this audience. Um, again, on the, on the left, what we see is um, we have differentiated. When you see this 50%, 20%, 20%, 10%, what does this mean? These are the games we see are profitable. There are many, many, many experiments. But if you look at the categorization of, it, of these buckets, uh, the most number of audiences that are playing this game is in roughly this percentage. Right? There may be many more games, but these are the games attracting a lot of audiences. And then uh, the 10% or so is the idle RPG variations. Multiple experiments are happening. The latest good example is uh, on the right, My Perfect Hotel by Say Games. Um, they took the classic Idle Tycoon and added some twist to it, uh, created new, uh, what we call the new age uh, RVs for this audience. Uh, but the thing to remember is that they've been doing this for the last two plus years, so this success is not overnight. So you need to invest a lot of time learning uh, the, uh, how to make these games, but also learning how to scale these games at a profitable range. So it's a, both for the publisher and the developer, it's a lot of work, right? Now, you can try by, start by doing this and achieve this success after two years, but the market might change. The key question, according to me here, is how do you make your own flavor of this game? How do you make your own ex experiments based on these inspirations, right? Otherwise, by the time you achieve the so-called uh, craftsmanship of making these games or making these games pr profitable, the market might change. But the core, the, the fund doesn't change. So ask yourself, what is the different experience I can craft according to my own strength? 
So a very high level overview of the game development and launch process, how uh, it has changed, and I think this is to stay for the next couple of years. It always starts with UA. Uh, find a marketable mechanic and theme. What does that mean? Um, I don't know how many of you guys have actually run tests, uh, but it's super easy to run, to check this using a Facebook uh, audience network test. Like you basically cre have a creative, create a creative, you don't have to spend more than $150 from our experience. We have tested with $50, $100, $150,000. But in the end, to get this information, it's enough to do a test for $150 uh, for three days or do $100 for two days. You will get this information. Think of statistical relevance. And, it is, and it's so often to get into this thought process that you get a high CPI of $1.50 or $2 or $3 that you need to spend more money but also think that you have to create a LTV above that number, right? And if you've never done it, the chances of doing it overnight are super, super low. So here I would say if you're doing it for the first time, still try to keep the CPI below a dollar. It is possible. It's not possible to have it less than 50 cents anymore, but the sweet spot we find is between uh, 60 to 70 cents um, if you're doing it for the first time. Um, again, how do you find this? Uh, Plenty of market intelligence tools like Sensor Tower. A good one to use, very simple one to use is also AppMagic. Cheaper, much cheaper, and really good UX. Um, I highly recommend that tool if you have never used any any of these tools, right? Uh, and then the key is like, okay, how do I make an engageable, uh, ga engageable game out of it? Um, the common uh, the common factors that um, I see across all these games is just having a deeper progression and a deeper economy, right? Go, both go hand in hand. What does this mean? The players are not averse to watching ads. They are averse to watching interstitials between the same experience, right? How do you make a different experience after they watch each ad? How do you give them a different experience when they watch a rewarded ads? Bear in mind, if you are you're still attracting the audience that is uh, not uh, have never used IAP, if you think introducing IAP is going to change the game, it's not. You're, it's a big psychological change, right? Think about it. You're talking. You're expecting a player to bring out their card and put the card number on a game or a brand they don't know about, versus you're expecting the players to watch like eight rewarded words, uh, ads instead of one. But what do they get in return? That's always the key question. Is it a better experience? Do they feel more powerful? Do they feel more satisfied? These are the key design questions, right? Then hybrid monetization. So what does this mean? So earlier it was like pretty simple formula, show uh, 10, 10 interstitials. I think it was like about 80 interstitials and 20% RVs, or even 90 inter and 10% RVs. Now um, play with different ratios, right? That is the key. You will see in the news, oh, there's a hybrid casual means 50% IAP. It's not true for every game. Look at the experience of your game, right? Look at the player behavior. It is also possible to achieve profitable games when you have a ratio of something like 60% rewarded videos and 30% inters at 10% IAP, or maybe it's 20% IAP. Really depends from game to game. You cannot use one formula across the genre, right? Um, and then depend, depending on what you see in these experiments, is what uh, you uh, what, how you calculate the ROAS window. Now, in the old hyper casual space, it was possible to achieve uh, um, ROAS return on ad spend within three days. It's impossible. You might get lucky with one out of three hundred games, right? Um, and then you talk about D seven, D fourteen, D thirty. You will also see uh, in the news from bigger publishers. We look for three sixty five ROAS or one eighty ROAS. I mean, come on. Can you really expect the player, uh, the, 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 you know, for you to achieve that when you are not done even D7 or D14? I don't think so. So if you're doing this for the first time, I would highly encourage, look at, don't look at any ROAS window beyond 30 days. It's, if you're not done this experience before, it's impossible to crack it like, you know, in six months or a year. What I can share right now is of the experiments we have done right now, it is still possible to have D14 ROAS. So if you're not done this before, I would highly encourage you to look into games that can achieve D14 ROAS, right? Once you do that, try for D30. Once you do that, try beyond. But I don't think if you have never done it before, or if you don't have games uh, that have achieved higher ROAS before, it's possible for you to achieve any ROAS beyond D30, right? So this is why the CPI is still important when you're testing a game. Um, live ops. So 
earlier never existed. Again, you would have heard live ops from uh, the classic casual mobile games. What's the difference here? The difference is in the live ops in the casual games are mostly uh, you service the players after they have played the game, events, um, you know, uh, rewards, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? Social. But the key difference here we feel is, or we see right now in our games and across publishers in the market, is live ops is the difference between break even and profitability. That means you're still working on the product. You should achieve, uh, you should be able to achieve ROAS break even or um, you know, no profitability without the live ops. That if you achieve that, it is possible that if your game allows for live ops, um, you can achieve uh, more profitability. What does that mean? You can scale the game better, right? That means you can increase the CPI, which means that you can get larger audience. Um, and we personally saw live ops as a game changer. We were a company as well who thought it is easier or more profitable to make uh, new games versus investing in old games. We never cared about it. And then we started our first experiment, I think, earlier this year uh, on this game called Spinamudge. And what we say, saw after three months was we achieved an RP, which is like average revenue per install or average revenue per user or however you call it, right? More than 61% and, which, and a playtime of increase of 80%. What does this mean? That means we were able to scale the game much, much more larger than initially without live ops. So now we also started live ops on our other game after three years of development. So the learning from this, it should be part of scaling. It's not an afterthought, it's important, right? So think about it, have a team for it. If you are a small team, talk to your publisher. I am, if this game into live, is going into live ops, what are the conditions? Because often your revenue share conditions depends on this, right? It should not be that because you did not think of it, the terms later are something that you don't agree with, right? Also, it's a common conflict problems between publishers and developers if you don't talk about it in the beginning. So it's super important. Also important, keep it agile, right? What does this mean? In classic uh, casual mobile games, you have a, usually you see a top-down approach. You think of the experience and then go from there building features. Whereas in these kind of games, what's important we see is like we have a bottom-up approach, so it's still mechanic-based. You do some small experiments and then see from there, can you build on it? Uh, and it's super important in this kind of games to really test everything within four to six weeks. Whereas in classic live ops, I think you test something in a quarter or more even. Um, and here we see that can um, that is not viable or profitable, right? Um, here, most important part, uh, I don't know how many of you are developers here or how many are published, how many are developers here or studios? Oh great, you're the majority, right? So the key question, who is the right publisher for me? Earlier it was, I think, pretty simple, who pays the greatest for a prototype uh, or who uh, gives you the best fees? It's super important to rethink this, why? So here I'm showing, uh, and, and it's super important to evaluate the publisher before going in it, uh, before, before signing up with them, because once you sign with the publisher, remember your fortunes are tied with the limitations or the experience of that publisher. How do you evaluate it? So here is the ecosystem of Sunday, the company I work for, but this is a good uh, breakdown of the components you can quiz the publisher. User acquisition. Question to ask here, do you scale on social? How much is your social scale? How do you scale on, um, how do you scale on uh, you know, SDK networks? Are you tied to one SDK network? For example, many, many uh, uh, SDK networks, like especially mediation partners, they do have some limitations, right? In terms of user acquisition, or sometimes the MMP has a limitation on user acquisition. Super important uh, to evaluate this that you should not be tied to or limited to user acquisition channels because in the end you do not know where your games will scale, right? Attribution or how we call it MMP, so we have our own in-house tool called Just Track. A lot of uh, companies also have started having, uh, not a lot, actually only two I think, have their own uh, uh, MMP tools. Why is this important? Because your data stays inside um, an MMP and plus uh, if you use a third-party MMP, there's either a direct cost or an indirect cost. What's a direct cost? Direct cost means every install or every install you get is, uh, is charged, which goes out of your revenue share, right? Because it's a cost. Second, indirect cost. For example, how many people here use game analytics? So who owns game analytics? Is, do you pay for game analytics? 
No, but nothing can be free in this world, right? So where does the money come from? So game analytics owned by a company, let me not name them, who has like, uh, who is, inter is also um, has another mediation partner or UA partner as part of that company. So data does go into influencing that kind of stuff. So please evaluate this kind of stuff. It should be completely neutral, right? Um, also look at, the, uh, look at do, does your publisher have in-house and external publishing both, why? Because uh, when, when you have in-house development, you are able to do deeper, deeper experiments, you usually spend more for the team, and super important that this publisher is able to share those learnings with you, because in the end, if you work in silos, you cannot win, right? So super important to ask, okay, what kind of games do your in-house development team works for? Ask them for updates, ask them the learnings, ask them how did they fail, how did they succeed. So it's super important for you to see if the publisher is able to share this data with you uh, or not, right? Um, and then also with external publishing, are they able to, of course, no one should uh, share confidential information, but I believe learnings can be uh, shared in a healthy way, right? Um, then it brings to our uh, Just Track and Sundash is our own uh, analytics, uh, but also like our own dashboard. Um, also evaluate, are you able, to, are you dependent on your publishing manager telling you what is working and what is not? Or does your publisher enable you to, um, you know, to learn on your own? In the end, what is your goal? Uh, is your goal to be a studio that always works for a publisher? Or is your goal to become self-publishing at some point? If your goal is to become self-publishing at some point, it's super important that you tie with a developer who helps you in this journey, right? Um, the most important part, attack. So, Typically, a mediation, this is how it works, right? There's a mediation layer, and the mediation layers uh, uh, charge um, a revenue share on the ads that are sold. So basically, you get the revenue after they do their revenue share. The biggest problem is a black box system. You never know what the bid is. Now, why, why, why is this a problem? Because according to our analysis, it, there is at least like 30 to 50% uh, cut on the revenue. Um, that is being come to the publisher or to you if you're directly working with the mediation layer. Why is this a problem? On one hand, the ECPMs on CPI has gone down, uh, sorry, gone up, and the, on the monetization has gone down, but the percentage doesn't share. So if you look at the shareholding uh, earnings of every mediation company in the world, I think only two you can look at, it's only going up. So when the whole market was earning less, it still remained the same. I do believe it's a problem, right? So we try to solve it in a different way, but it's important to ask two questions here. How do we get better revenue share from our mediation partner? Which mediation partner do you work with? For example, we work with 0% fees. So what does that mean? We don't have to share anything, so we share more with the developer. You should ask your publisher the same questions. Um, what is the mediation partner? Do you own it? Are you tied to it? For example, it can happen that uh, there are like um, exclusivity some mediation partners, and this mediation partner might not be the best choice for certain games on certain network. So the healthy way to look at it is there should be no restriction. For example, a game can uh, have better attribution or better earn better revenue in iOS through one mediation partner and uh, and better in another mediation partner in another network. We do see that for a couple of games earns better to someone. And, uh, like someone like Ionso, uh, sorry, Max in iOS or someone like Ionso in Android, and you should be open to do it. In the end, your best interests matter, right? Not the exclusivity of the publisher, because you do not get the benefit of it. So for choosing the right publisher, please make sure from now on, it's better to ask all these questions to understand uh, uh, who you're siding with. But it's also OK that if someone has exclusivity, but then what do you get in return? Why are you getting into this deal, right? But on a personal note, I don't think exclusive agreements are healthy anymore because the market is changing and um, no one publisher uh, is able to win it all. All right, we spoke a lot, so let's summarize. So a very uh, high-level overview of next-gen production overview. What does this mean? Always start with UA. Does it mean find your mass marketable mechanic and theme? The only difference is now you don't do an ad anymore. You do an ad press prototype. You need to get like your early engagement to see if the game is working. I trade for product app. I trade, I trade, I trade. Earlier it was uh, possible to launch from concept to uh, scale in three months. Now the period window has increased. But the difference is 
test monetization early, right? Just to achieve product depth, don't do it without ads. Why? Because we have seen in several cases, we do that, and then after four or five months, when you put ads, the retention goes down by like more than 50%. So it's not a profitable business case anymore. So high recommendation is after you achieve your D1 uh, metric, start testing with ads. Um, test different monetization strategies. Again, uh, I mean, there's no, there's not more than three, right? RVs, inters, and IAP. But the ratios, right? This is what you need to experiment with. The ratios, I believe, are different for different games. It doesn't stick to one genre anymore. Why? Because it believes uh, it, it depends on your user behavior. And then scale via live ops. It's super important that most of the games this, uh, uh, during this stage, which are profitable, you need to have live ops while scaling. This is the difference between you scaling to 5 million or 10 million or 50 million or 100 million. So think about, have a vision. Can we have anything in live ops when we launch the game? But don't forget, this is still hyper casual production process. Test, 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 right? So if you do, try to have a testing process every four to six weeks from the time you start. These are the learnings I believe we should keep from hyper casual that still apply to uh, mass marketable games, mass marketable creatives that still work. How to go them? Look at market intelligence tool, do a small test in Facebook. $150, $200, even $100 do the, uh, do the trick, right? Simple core. However complex your game should be, the core should be simple. The rules shouldn't change the, because the problem is the business is gone, right? Not the fun. The fun is still there. You need to think of a different business model. Then test-based iterative production process. Don't wait for three or four months without testing anything. More likely you will fail, right? Then early monetization validation. Look if it is, um, if it is monetizable in the way that you envision. For example, if you say, no, it is a, just an IAP-based game, I have a higher LTV, obviously then you're a different audience, your strategy is changing, and you should change your publisher, right? Not work with a publisher who's uh, like us, uh, who are dependent on ad-monetized games. So here's a studio for the studio checklist, right? I will say, like, identify your strength profile. Don't go and make every game. Don't go for more than two types of games. Achieve because you need this time to do multiple experiments, learn from it, um, you know, apply these learnings in your next experiment, and maybe after six months or whatever your time frame, your run runway is, reevaluate: is this the right kind of game I am working on? Do I have the right people? For example, you've never made a, uh, let's say you've never made a, um, you know, power progression game. Do you even play those games? Do you even understand those games, right? Or is it like I'm happy making simple puzzle games for this audience, which might be a smaller jump, according to the uh, interviews we had had, because the uh, puzzle experiences are still simple core loop, right? Maybe you need to add just one or two people to your studios to achieve this, versus hiring eight or ten new people with different skill set to achieve the other type of games, right? So go with your strengths. And also, what is the learning from the publishers you get, right, or that you, you work with? Identify your audience, right? This is the key design question, I feel, um, that you should ask. How am I creating a new experience that is familiar to this audience, right? What does this mean? Uh, when when uh, I was researching on what kind of games we should do, I read a lot, and this one book I highly recommend really, really helped me rethink how to think about creativity, breaks a lot of myths. Uh, it's called The Creative Curve by Alan Gannett. And then it gives examples from different creative fields, not just games, ice creams. How does Ben & Jerry come with um, uh, you know, new flavors? And the key thing is, if you introduce something completely new to an audience, it will not work. If you think this is something new and I will succeed, it is because others have tried before you and they have not succeeded and that's why you don't see it. Right, and then for the audience, it's always about like familiarity, right? Think of Bollywood music as well, Bapilari and Dalai Man, or whoever you listen to. It is always familiar. If they come up with something new, even Shah Rukh Khan movies, right? Every time you go, you see some. It's you expect what to see. So this is, applies to even games, right? People need always go from familiarity. So apply this. But uh, don't clone or don't reskin because it, it, that's the difference between a flop Shah Rukh Khan movie and a hit Shah Rukh Khan movie, right? So think of it in this way. So, and then always, if your publisher says or if you say that I want to get, uh, achieve the greatest engagement before testing monetization, highly likely you will fail. If your publisher pushes you, push them back. Hey, I need to see what is the, what, like, 
how is this game monetizable? Because in the end, if you don't see it in the first two weeks, uh, sorry, first two months from the time you start, it's a hole, big, big hole that you're creating, right? It's a sinkhole. Please don't do that. Also, don't be, I know for every, every studio, every game de a designer, the game says the baby is right, you're too stuck to it, don't be afraid to kill early. That will save you. Okay, so again, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me at this email ID. And yeah, we can thank our sponsors for organizing this amazing conference and this talk. So thank you. Do you have any questions? I think, I think we have a few minutes for questions. The question is like, uh, when you decide like uh, it's time to kill the game, basically, is there any kind of, uh, based on your, your uh, experience, is there any kind of metrics you look at and kind of mm -hmm. experiments you, you wanted to like uh, try it before decide that, okay, it's time mm -hmm. to kill the mm -hmm. game? So a few ways to look at it, right? For example, I said introduce uh, monetization early and if you are dependent on ad monetization, the moment, let's say you achieve a D1 of 40%, 45%, that is your target in most games, right? The moment you achieve, uh, you put the ads, and let's say it goes down by 50%, it's super simple. Either you're attracting the low, uh, wrong audience, or your mechanic needs to change, right? Then you kill the game, rethink of the game again. The other thing is, if you're not able to achieve, uh, in the end, we want to make profitable games, right? If you're not able to achieve a ROAS window of uh, based, on, uh, based on the CPI, then we also decide to kill the game after like three or four months, right? In the end, I don't think there's a point of working on a game for more than four months if in four months you're not able to see that the game is profitable or not. When do you think is the ideal time for the monetization test? Sorry? When do you think is the ideal time for the first monetization mm -hmm. test? Uh, again, depends on the type of game you are doing, but let's take a classic example of the so-called puzzle experiences. I do believe if you achieve your uh, CPI, uh, uh, of whatever you're aiming for, I think ideally it should be less than a dollar. Um, and then if you achieve your D1 retention of like 45%, I think that's the right time to uh, test monetization. Because two things, one, you need to get the early LTV indicator uh, to design your roadmap, uh, or you need to see that, okay, this is this the right audience or not. Um, let's talk about uh, power progression games or so-called hybrid games. I do believe the you need to check monetization within like three months of development, right? The first, you might not achieve what you look for, but you will know that it's about increasing 10 percentage points or is it doubling? If it's about doubling, I don't think you will achieve it. But then what if the game doesn't have the D1 of over 45% within the three months into development? Would you still test the game for monetization, or would you have the developer keep working? After achieving 45%? Before, but it's been already three Depends months. on the speed of the developer as well, right? Sometimes we have like solo developer who are slow. So three months is like, a pro like the time we are willing to spend focus on it, right? So it can also be, I'm super happy if you can do it in one month. <laughs> but it's normally not possible because you're trying to find multiple creatives to get the best API. Uh, but three, three months is the most outer limit. Earlier, the better. No, I was just questioning because I personally think that <laughs> um, without the engagement metrics, early monetization test usually hurts the engagement. If you start introducing interstitials, um, when you don't have enough content to achieve, let's say, 45%. But you, like, you decide to test your game like early on without enough content, without having like good retention profile. I think it actually does more harm than good to the games. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on this. Again, um, which, what retention are you talking about, right? I'm, I'm, all I'm saying is once you get the early retention that you achieve, does it still hold? That's the key question. In the end, if it doesn't hold, you can never achieve late retention, right? So it's about saying, if, if I achieve 45%, does it go down to 35 when I introduce ads, or does it go to 20? If it goes down to 20, like 95 or 99.9%, .9%, it will not work without you changing the mechanic itself. But let's say you achieve, you introduce monetization and you see, okay, I need a, my LTB versus CPI, the ratio is about like 80%, um, and I need to craft my experience 
later that does give you a data point as to what you are going for, right? In the end, a simple formula to see is, okay, what is the playtime I want, unique playtime I want, uh, divided by the ads that I need to experience, give this to, right? And then there you can play with different ratios. Earlier it was every 30 seconds. I don't think it works anymore. But what is your audience preferring? Is it like every 45 seconds and in what form, right? Is it inters or is it RVs? I also think if it's just inters, it doesn't work anymore. Um, but also you may discover that a core of your audience, like less than 1%, may be high IAP payers. Maybe it works for your game. So this is why check the user behavior by, by the monetization strategy, right? In the end, engagement without monetization doesn't make sense for the longest time. That, that was my point. Yes, thank you. And, um, but do you think it's, um, it's necessary for developers to put IAP monetization when first going into? No. Yeah, okay. Absolutely not. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, maybe the last one. What's the time? So can you talk more about the like audience not expecting everything, anything that is completely new, like the familiarity to the mm -hmm. like a completely new ratio or like how do you uh, navigate that thing basically? So yeah. to rephrase your question, it's about how do we decide if it's completely new or if, if it's familiar? Yeah. Yeah. And to just uh, how to balance them if there is something new and familiar, both of them. Like, Okay, I can answer the first question. Balancing, you have to do a lot of experiments, right? Okay. So the key question while balancing, is this a clone or a reskin, right? Uh, and what is the new experience? So let's take an example. You know the game, <coughs> I showed the game Parking Jam 3D, right? It, it, so so what, what's the, let's say you're going to make a game based on Parking Jam 3D. If you look at the game from a very high level, there are a few elements you can think of. One is the theme, cars, parking. Everybody in the US can relate to parking and, uh, and cars, right? Now, if you reskin this with like parking planes, how many people can relate with it? Do they really like park planes or boats? I think I've seen some experiments, but if it's not relatable, it's, it will not work. Second is, uh, what, 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 do you, what does the audience see when you make the creative ad for your new game? Is, does they, do they, remind, they get reminded of parking jam? Or let's say you put like parking, uh, I think there was one experiment we did like with farm animals, completely absurd, right? You think it's familiar, but it's not familiar to the people who are uh, used to parking cars or see this game as a parking jam, uh, parking concept, right? Then the goal, what is the goal? You clear the screen, then the mechanics. So then you see, what do I retain out of these elements? Then color theme, art style. So there's like five, six elements from the game, and ideally the ratio is like, keep 50% familiar, right? And experiment with the rest 50. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Then I think, thank you.